Okay, welcome. This is going to be the new Keynesian model. We recently discussed the real business cycle model, and we looked at some of the empirical tests of the real business cycle model and saw where it fell short in explaining certain types of shocks, namely demand-side shocks. It explained supply shocks extremely well, but any demand shock had no real effect. All that happened was that the price level changed, and in the, in the presence of a government spending shock, there would be an increase in the real interest rate. But any sort of monetary policy shocks, which, you know, is, is being a monetary economics course, um, if it doesn't explain how the monetary policy shocks work, well, then why the hell did we learn it? Well, we learned it so that we could learn about the new Keynesian model, right? The real business cycle model is a nice stepping stone up to this. This is sort of like the major, major model that we will be concerned about within this course. So, yeah, like I said before, real business cycle model was excellent at talking about supply side shocks, but it was really, really bad with demand side shocks. Therefore, we need to develop and understand a model that gives us predictions where demand side and nominal shocks can have real effects on the economy, something that we didn't see with the real business cycle model. So in order to change things, we need to change some of our under, yeah, underlying assumptions. The first is that the two welfare theorems aren't satisfied. If the two welfare theorems aren't satisfied, what that means is there are equilibria that are considered to be inefficient, where there can be some sort of policy intervention to try to increase the efficiency of the equilibria within all of these markets. There's also monopolistic competition in at least one of the markets. Recall the real business cycle model had perfect competition, therefore there was no markup of price above marginal cost. So price was equal to marginal cost across the board. Well, that's not really something that is going to be considered feasible within this model. Now, there can be some prices that are equal to marginal cost, but there are also markets that do not have price equal to marginal cost. And we'll talk about how the firm sets its price above marginal cost in a number of ways within the constraints that they face. Recording equivalence doesn't hold. So if you recall, recording equivalence is when the household internalizes the budget's government or the government's budget constraint. Therefore, the timing of the government expenditures doesn't matter. If, say, for, an ex for example, the government wants to build a bridge. They can finance it one of two ways. They can finance it with debt, which they have to pay back later by raising taxes, or they can raise taxes today and then build it tomorrow. According to Ricardian equivalence, it doesn't matter because the tax stuff and the bond holding stuff within the household's budget constraint just completely cancels out. So on the margin, it is not affecting the consumption savings decisions that are found within the Euler equation. But if that doesn't hold, well, we get slightly different results out of this. Monetary neutrality also doesn't hold. If you remember in the real business cycle model, a monetary policy shock will increase aggregate demand, but if we have a vertical aggregate supply curve, there's no change to output whatsoever, and the only variables that change are nominal variables. If only nominal variables change in response to a monetary policy shock, well, that's monetary neutrality. But in this model, it doesn't hold, whereas it did in the real business cycle model. So monetary policy shocks can actually have real effects now rather than just looking at nominal effects. Um, prices don't fully adjust, at least immediately, in response to shocks. So that means we basically have sticky prices, prices that are slow to adjust, after some aggregate demand shock. And we'll sort of get into why that is a little bit later as well. But we also see that policymakers now actually face trade-offs when using policy to try to impact the business cycle. So in the real business cycle model, they couldn't really do much, right? There was no um, like endogenous response that policymakers faced when they were like when they were using policy to try to smooth the business cycle because there's nothing they could do, right? The only time they can do something is if there are major inefficiencies within the market that need to be corrected, at least in the short term. So we're going to talk about how these differences can actually lead to different results within the model, right? Because if you change the underlying assumptions, if you really, if you have fewer simplifying assumptions within the model, that's going to give you radically different results.
So let's think about this in context of making a movie, right? So if you make a movie, first you need good characters. Then after the characters, well, you need a good plot, and you need a good resolution for the plot, right? So the characters here would be the optimization part of this empirical or this economic analysis, right? Because everybody has to optimize here. And then the plot and the resolution would be trying to find an equilibrium from all of these optimizing agents. And that sort of wraps up the movie. But then, you know, to see if the movie's any good, you have to release it to the critics, who, I mean, are really just a bunch of hacks. But some of them are decent, I guess, sometimes. And so it gets released to the critics, and the critics will go, okay, well, yeah, this is either really good or this isn't so good. That's the empirical analysis, All right? So when we did the empirical analysis of the real business cycle model, that was kind of like, you know, the, the Siskel and Ebert of 2020 instead of 1996 or 97, whenever it was that they kind of stopped making stuff. Uh, but yeah, we got to play like movie critic there. Well, we're going to be playing movie critic here as well. So, and actually we're probably going to be looking at some of the same sets of impulse responses and we're going to see that they match up much better with the new Keynesian model than they do the real business cycle model. Now, the household has a similar utility function, and they choose between consumption and leisure and from holding real money balances, just like what we saw before. So this would be the utility function in a more abstract form rather than imposing a strict, uh, well-defined functional form. So we're not really going to get too far into that because no, there's just lots of optimization, lots of math, and you've already seen the optimization. There's really no point in trying to hit you with it again. But by having money in there, that's going to allow us to derive a money demand equation, right? The consumption stuff is going to give us the Euler equation. The labor stuff is going to give us a labor supply equation. So as far as the setup of the utility function is concerned, it's really not all that different from what we saw in previous models. So yeah, other than that, there's not much more I can really say about the household. So we're just going to move on to the firm, which is the next character in the movie, right? Because any movie with just one character is kind of a boring movie. But if you've got multiple characters, it gets kind of interesting. So the firms in the RBC model were considered to be identical. So it was kind of like there's just one representative firm that produced one aggregate output good Y. But that wasn't very realistic. There's a lot of heterogeneity across production and taking advantage of that heterogeneity can really help us out when it comes to analyzing the model. So instead of having a bunch of identical firms, there's actually a bunch of different firms, we'll call them firm J, that produce various final consumer goods. They face a demand curve where the price that they set is a markup above marginal cost, which we'll call mu, it's that silly looking U thing, and it's dependent on the elasticity of demand, we'll call it theta j. So that theta j is the elasticity of demand for firm j. So this means if demand becomes more inelastic, firms can change, they can charge a markup over marginal cost and they can extract a little consumer surplus. So if demand is more inelastic, recall that means price, or firms have more pricing power the more pricing power they have, the more they can charge a markup over the marginal cost of production, which allows them to extract some consumer surplus. But this isn't entirely a good thing for the firm. In a one-shot sort of game, you could think of it as being pretty decent for the firm. But when we're looking at it in a dynamic framework, there's a lot more that we have to consider, namely the fact that firms are forward-looking and prices are slow to adjust, and there is inflation in this model. So we'll say that each firm J faces a demand curve that's described by this relation right here. So the consumption of good J at time T is equal to this lowercase p sub JT, where that is the price of good J produced by firm J at time T, divided by this capital PT, which is the aggregate price level. So it's a ratio of prices. It's the ratio of the good produced by firm J to the prices of all other goods being produced in that economy. And it's raised to the power of negative theta J. So that power, that negative theta J, is the elasticity of demand for that particular good. 
Now, this is a necessary addition for two reasons within the model. First, it makes it a more realistic assumption, right? Because there are a lot of firms out there that have a lot of pricing power that automatically would sort of render the real business cycle model kind of moot. But it also allows for these firms to set prices above marginal cost today so that in the event they can't change their prices in the next few periods, because remember I said prices are slow to adjust. We'll talk about the pricing mechanism in a second, but ultimately sort of the way it works is you can set your prices today, but you don't know if you'll be able to set them tomorrow. You don't know if you'll be able to set them day after. You really have no idea exactly when you'll be able to change your prices. So what you're going to do is you're going to set the price above marginal cost today. So yeah, you might make a gain today, but over time, while you can't adjust your prices, but there are more and more demand shocks, you are ultimately going to first break even, and then you might even end up taking a little bit of a loss. Hopefully, the loss that you take is going to be equal, like the discounted present value of the loss that you take is going to be equal to the additional profit through the extraction of consumer surplus that you'll be earning today. So they'll sort of cancel each other out over time. Therefore, firms are forward-looking, right? They're looking to the future, not just for their own production stuff, but also to make sure that they don't operate at a huge loss sometime in the future. So, yeah, why wouldn't they be able to change prices? Um, well, they aren't able to change prices because of something known as a nominal rigidity which means that a nominal variable can't move as much as it normally would to be able to work in a flexible price equilibrium. So if we have a perfectly vertical aggregate supply curve, there are no nominal rigidities. But if prices can't immediately respond to aggregate demand shocks, well, that would be a nominal rigidity. It's, an, it's a rigidity in the price, which is a nominal variable. So because the price can't immediately respond... We are not in a flexible price equilibrium, therefore aggregate demand shocks will in the short run have real effects. So let's think of it through a cool little example. Let's say you're Subway, and you've been campaigning on this $5 foot long for quite some time now. I believe it was re really first introduced in like 2008, and it seemed like a pretty good deal for them. But there have been tons of economic shocks that stimulate aggregate demand over the years. And you'd like to be able to change your prices, but it's kind of hard for you to do that because it would kind of be a bad PR move if you just changed prices in the middle of this price setting campaign, right? Because you're running on a $5 foot long, but then there's this aggregate demand shock and you're like, oh man, it'd be so much better if we just had $6 foot longs instead of $5 foot longs. But that doesn't really have the same nice little flow to it. it doesn't jive the same way there's actually it just it doesn't look good plus people are going to be kind of mad at you why would you you know you're just running this five dollar foot long why did you raise prices well i mean the reason they raised prices is because they had to be able to cover their asses but you know people aren't really going to be thinking about that they're going to be thinking why are you trying to screw us over so you keep the foot long priced at five dollars at least for the time being it's sort of one of those, like Ted Kennedy said, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So that's one example as to why the price may not be able to move all that much. But there are other reasons as well. Suppose you work at the corporate office of Outback Steakhouse. I'm using Outback because I worked there for like years. And so, you know, eventually you get kind of familiar with the way uh, the corporate office works at Outback. Um, and let's say there's the exact same economic shock that hits Subway, and you know you'll have to raise your prices in order to adjust to the new demand. Uh, but that means raising all the prices at every Outback restaurant. If you want to do that, well, you got to print a ton of new menus. You have to get the new look of the menus approved by marketing, probably have to come up with some new sleazy campaign where you, you know, remodel a bunch of your restaurants just to justify the price hike that happened at the restaurant I was working at. Um, you you kind of have to 
revamp a lot of things in order to justify why you're raising these prices. <clears throat> but that costs a lot of money. I mean, just the menus alone would probably cost millions and millions and millions of dollars to develop, change the prices, you know, get the new look approved, all that. And then all the other stuff you do to try to justify why you raised the price, well, that's just going to add on even more. So it might be a cost that you're willing to take, but you're maybe not willing to take it just right yet. So in the meantime, before you can do that, well, your prices can't change. Therefore, you're probably going to end up making more stuff, which you may end up sort of operating at a loss if the price ends up being below your marginal costs of production. So you face the cost of printing new menus. It's called menu costs in macroeconomics. But you also need to justify the price hike a bit so you don't lose out on business just for raising prices because people are going to get mad. Um, now, people aren't going to be happy, especially if, say, their competitor Longhorn don't raise their prices at the same time. So you could end up in a situation where it's cheaper to just not raise your prices at first and you do so a little later. These would be nominal rigidities faced in the real world. So these are some of the nominal rigidities that with regard to the slow response of price to aggregate demand shocks that we could see in like actual real world applications. These nominal rigidities in this case are called sticky prices, and incorporating this was a fairly tough thing to figure out for some of these modelers who were really coming fresh out of the real business cycle model but weren't 100% happy with some of the predictions that were provided by the RBC model. So they had to find a way that they could allow for prices to be slow to adjust that mathematically made sense and how they were incorporated within the model. And the idea actually ended up being pretty simple, which is, you know, good for everybody around. It was good for them because, well, it was easy for them to model it. And it's good for us because it's easy for us to understand. Consider there is a fraction of firms, omega, right, where omega would be between zero and one, that can't change their prices each period. Therefore, there's a fraction, one minus omega, of firms that can change their prices each period. So because this omega is bound between 0 and 1, right, where omega plus 1 minus omega is equal to 1, if, say, omega is 0.15, then 15% of firms can't change their prices each period, whether there's a shock or not. The other 85% can change their prices. So this is kind of a probability, right? It means that every single period there is a 15% probability or 0.15 probability that you won't be able to change your price, meaning there's a 0.85 probability that you can change your price each period. So you're going to be setting your price above marginal cost based on your expectations of what you think will happen in the future. There's an 85% chance you can change your price in the next period. Well, okay, maybe you're not gonna set your price that far above marginal cost. But let's flip these probabilities. Let's say there's a, fi or 0.15 probability that you can change your prices. Well, all of a sudden, now you're probably going to want to set your price a little bit higher than marginal cost, more than what you had it before, because if there's only a 15% chance you can raise your prices each period, that means you're probably going to be going for the long haul on this one, and you want to make sure that you're not going to go under just because it's bad for you to try to change your prices. Now, the model assumes that firms know omega, right? They know what the probability of them being able to change their price is, but they don't know if they specifically will be able to change their prices in the next period. So there's a 0.15 probability that they can't change their prices each period and a 0.85 probability, which is just one minus 0.15, that they can change their prices each period. Now, this mechanism is what's known as Calvo pricing, presumably named after some guy named Calvo. And it implies that firms have to be forward-looking when they set their prices because they know that each period in the future, there's a 15% chance that they won't be able to make any adjustments. Therefore, they 
incorporate that into their expectations, and that tells them how they need to be able to set their price. So they set their price above what the marginal cost is, basically as a CYA measure for the future so that they don't end up losing a ton of money. Now, each successive period, this omega is raised to a higher power. So for the first period, the probability is just omega to the first power, or 0.15 to the first power. In the second period, it's 0.15 squared, right? So 0.15 times 0.15 is going to be less than just 0.15. Third period, well, you cube 0.15, right? So any number between 0 and 1, if you raise the power, right, that's going to give you a smaller number than what you had before. So every single period, the probability of you being able to change your price falls. So ultimately, What's going to happen is as you raise the power of this guy and it gets smaller and smaller, the probability that you can change your prices as t goes to infinity or as the time horizon that you're looking out approaches infinity, you eventually will be able to change your prices. Might be a while, but in the long run, you will be able to change your prices. So in the short run, firms can't do much, but in the long run, they definitely can. So in the long run, prices are fully flexible. Hopefully this is kind of starting to see where we can tie this into the real business cycle model. Because as we saw with the real business cycle model, a lot of real variables in response to these shocks started converging back to their original steady states, right? Like output converged back to its steady state. Hours worked converged back to their steady state. Real wages converged back to their steady states. And there was a jump in the price level, and the price level just kind of kept going up, and it, as it was going up, it went up at a relatively slow rate, assuming that eventually prices would reach some sort of stability. And basically all firms could change their prices. And we saw the real variables basically be unaffected in the long run which, yeah, lines up entirely with what the real business cycle model suggests. Now, this is what's known as the neoclassical synthesis. There's a synthesis between neoclassical and New Keynesian models. The New Keynesian model works better in the short run, but the RBC model tends to work better in the long run. Those are also assumed to have rational expectations. What's that? Well, we kind of already learned rational expectations when we were learning about the time and consistency problem of monetary policy. If we think about it in a game theoretical perspective, it says that every player in a game will have full and complete information on what the other players are going to do. So it means that they basically know what the central bank's objective function is going to be, right? And the central bank is going to be the third character in our movie. So if they know what the central bank's objective function is, it means that they know what the central bank's incentives are. They know not just what their incentives are, but also what their strategies are going to be. They're, they know what strategies they're going to pick in this particular game, and they're going to be prepared in advance for those strategies. And absolutely fantastic thing we can actually see here how rational expectations if you remember with the time and consistency problem the rational expectations ultimately rendered the central bank's monetary expansion entirely moot right because everyone knew what the central bank was going to do for their inflation but that again assumed that prices were flexible here what we're seeing is that prices aren't flexible so even if everybody knows what the central bank's going to do if their prices aren't flexible, there's not much they can do in response to the shock. All they can do is just set their price even more above marginal cost if they're aware that the central bank is going to be like increasing the money supply, thereby lowering interest rates. So ultimately, we can see that rational expectations do kind of line up with this model where you can still have rational expectations, but these nominal rigidities still allow prices to move fairly slowly, thereby meaning there will be an increase in output, at least in the short run. But 
rational expectations don't just show up in economics. I mean, they, they show up everywhere. Uh, if you actually want to know a really good case where this assumption appears, uh, we can ask the seven psychopaths from, well, the movie Seven Psychopaths, which came out in 2012. Absolutely phenomenal movie. So, um, yeah, let's watch this short little clip, and you'll see exactly where rational expectations pop up. Exterior. Cemetery. Night. The shootout. Yeah. The Jack o Diamonds is waiting there with Bonnie, and he's arranged to give him back and have this whole thing end, because all he really wants is peace. You know, like Gandhi, or Jesus, or the, that other guy. Anyway, he's waiting there for the mafia boss, who's agreed to show up alone and unarmed, but yeah, guess what? Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Surely he knows that the mafia boss is a psycho. Why would he believe he'd show up alone and unarmed? Hmm. You know? Yeah. Exactly! Maybe the Jack o' Diamonds was expecting to get double-crossed because he just happens to have brought a couple of friends along. Suddenly, from out of every... And that, ladies and gents, is a prime example of rational expectations. So at the beginning when he's like, you know, he agrees to show up on an arm, unarmed because... Obviously, you know, the, the crazy mob mafia guy is going to show up unarmed as well, but then Colin Farrell's like, well, I mean, surely, you know, this guy knows he's a psychopath. Why would he assume that he's going to show up unarmed? And then Sam Rockwell's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then all of a sudden it turns out, you know, everybody was prepared for that. That would be rational expectations because if you're going to ask this mob boss who you just basically stole a dog from, and the dog is the only thing that he really cares about. Um, if you're going to ask him to show up so you can give him his dog back, but he's a psycho and he's been killing a bunch of people trying to get his dog back, you're probably not going to assume he's going to show up unarmed. He's probably going to come armed to the teeth with a bunch of other people that are armed to the teeth and just mow everybody down so he can get his dog back. Therefore... If there are rational expectations, you would go, okay, he says he's going to show up unarmed, but I know he's actually going to show up armed, so I'm going to show up armed as well. And then you have that whole thing with all the psychopaths coming out, and they're all shooting people, and guns and America and stuff like that. So, yeah, that, that would be an excellent example of rational expectations because everybody knows what everybody else's objective function is going to be or what everybody else's motives are going to be. So, yeah. Rational expectations. Firms work kind of in the same way with, you know, fewer guns, dogs, and uh, psychopaths. But same idea. So, anyways, we can move on from there. I just wanted to give a, a cool little real, not real world, fictional world that exists in the real world because, you know, movies and stuff where rational expectations show up. But enough rambling for me for now. <clears throat> so, firms know if the central bank's going to want to inflate. Right? The central bank might say they don't want to inflate, but firms know that they will try to inflate to stimulate output. So they set their prices in advance. We could compare this to the Jack of Diamonds guy, the guy that is currently holding the dog. No going to be showing up armed. Therefore, he shows up armed. Right? If the central bank wants to inflate and firms know that, Jack of Diamonds knows that crazy psycho guy is going to be showing up with guns. So what does he do? He shows up with guns. What do the firms do? Well, they set their prices in advance. And they set their prices above marginal cost to allow for them to be able to stay afloat even in the presence of monetary policy shocks. Now, normally, like if we were thinking about the time and consistency problem, you'd think this would render monetary policy useless in the real economy, but that little omega term is what lets firms that do have rational expectations uh, be still unable to adjust fully and properly in response to these types of shocks. So let's think about this in terms of supply and demand. If prices can't adjust in a supply and demand framework, Right, So just price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis. 
and we've got a supply curve and a demand curve. If prices can't adjust immediately in this framework, then what is the only thing that can respond? Output. So if prices are sticky, firms can't change their prices as much as they would like to, so they have to respond with altering output instead, meaning they have to produce more, right? If you run like a taco stand and you get this massive influx of customers and you can't change your price immediately, you have to serve more customers. But the next day you can change your prices. So you're gonna up the prices a little bit and the expectation or preparing in advance for this second demand shock that's gonna come through, therefore, you don't produce as much stuff because you're already optimizing, right? The amount that you were planning to produce earlier was the optimizing amount. You don't want to produce more than that. You don't want to produce less than that. If you do have to produce more than that, well, you're going to want to raise your prices. Otherwise, you aren't optimizing. So that's kind of what's going on with these firms here. That's sort of what the the, the, the intuition behind this mechanism is. So, okay, yeah, well, I gave the example a little, a little prematurely. If you run a Taco Bell, sell 100 tacos a day, there's a demand shock. The new demand is for 200 tacos. You have, yeah, one of two options. Raise the price to keep making 100 tacos or make more than 100 tacos. If prices are perfectly sticky, that means omega is equal to one. Well, you're stuck making 200 tacos. If prices are only kind of sticky, say 0.4, well, then you can plan to be able to produce 140 tacos if needed because your price went up a little bit, but it didn't go up all the way. So in this framework, it means that we only have one aggregate demand curve, but we technically have two aggregate supply curves. There's the short run aggregate supply curve. This is the upward sloping aggregate supply curve and its slope is determined by omega. The larger omega is, right, the fewer firms that can change their prices, the flatter this curve is going to get. Meaning, there will be more of a response in output than there will be in price when there is an aggregate demand shock. But then there's also the long run aggregate supply, right? This is the vertical supply curve that we saw predicted by the real business cycle model. When prices become perfectly flexible in the long run, we move to the long run aggregate supply curve for analysis. So here's the neat thing though. Firms price based on omega, because remember firms know what omega is. So what happens if all the firms know omega is zero because omega is equal to zero? Well, Basically, this short run aggregate supply curve becomes steeper and steeper and steeper. And as omega becomes equal to zero, the short run aggregate supply curve becomes vertical. When the short run aggregate supply curve is vertical, it is equal to the long run aggregate supply curve. And everything essentially reduces down to the flexible price model. And we get the exact same predictions as what we get in the real business cycle model. So really what the real business cycle model is, is a special case of the new Keynesian model. Another way of saying it is the RBC model is nested within the new Keynesian model, which is a fairly interesting finding here. It's really cool. So basically, if we have an aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework in this model, it's going to look like this. So again, I have suppressed the ISLM stuff above the aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph. But what we can see is other than that, it's exactly the same thing, right? We've got our labor markets, we have production, we've got that little translation curve thing where output is equal to output. So it flips output from being on the vertical axis to being on the horizontal axis so we can have price on the vertical axis. Now, as we you know trace down, okay, this is the labor market equilibrium. We trace it down to the output curve over to this translation graph here, shift it up. Well, this is the aggregate supply curve that's predicted by the real business cycle model. But the new Keynesian model introduces this short run aggregate supply curve. So in the short run, prices aren't entirely quick to adjust. So if there's this aggregate demand shock, aggregate demand is here, but let's say it shifts out to here. Well, this is our new point of output. This would be our new price level. And 
in the short run, this is our equilibrium. However, in the long run, what happens is this short run aggregate supply curve keeps shifting in until it crosses with the long run aggregate supply, which is also where the new aggregate demand curve shifted earlier on. So in the short run, output will increase, but in the long run, as this guy shifts back, we end up at output right where we were beforehand. So this lines up with what Milton Friedman was talking about in his presidential address, where the central bank may actually be able to increase output above its natural rate, or another way of thinking about it is to reduce unemployment below its natural rate here and there. However, in the long run, output is going to return to its natural rate and unemployment will also return to its natural rate. And the only way they can get that to happen again is to increase inflation even more. They have to print more money. They have to lower interest rates even further. And there are limits to that. If they're using the interest rate as their policy instrument, well, the nominal interest rate can't really go below zero. So there's a zero lower bound for nominal interest rates. And since the Federal Reserve is setting a nominal interest rate, the overnight lending rate between banks, if they're setting that, well, that thing can't go below zero. Therefore, there are limits to monetary expansion. So at the aggregate here in the short run, Slowly adjusting prices mean that output can respond to demand-side shocks now, whereas it couldn't earlier. Now, there's an equation for this in the model. The new Keynesian Phillips curve is that short-run aggregate supply curve that you see here. This is the new Keynesian Phillips curve where the mouse is going. Now, what this says is that there's a trade-off between output and inflation, and it looks like this. And you're probably like, oh my god, dude, I thought you said you were going to give us less math. Well, yeah, it looks like a ton of math. So let's kind of play around with some of this to get it to make some more sense. So, okay, I've got pi t equals beta times the expectation of pi t plus 1, which is expected inflation, times kappa times theta hat t. So let's start with this, what this theta hat t is. This is what's known as the output gap, and it's expressed in terms of a percentage deviation of output from the flexible price output. It's ultimately the difference between the new Keynesians sticky price output and the real business cycle models flexible price output. So this theta hat t here is equal to gamma, which we'll get into in a second, times this yt hat is the new Keynesian sticky price output, and this yt hat with a little f superscript is the real business cycle model's flexible price output. So this tells me if the sticky price output from the new Keynesian model is larger than the real business cycle model's flexible price output, we have a positive output gap. Right? The economy is producing above what the flexible price equilibrium would suggest. If, on the other hand, this is negative, right? if the new Keynesian sticky price output is less than the real business cycle model's flexible price output, well, the output gap is negative. So when the output gap is positive, the point of the central bank is to, while they do enjoy the output gap being positive, it can in some cases lead to overheating of the economy where you'll see massive inflation. So what the Fed will do is they'll kind of kick some inflation in to, or sorry, they'll kick some contractionary monetary policy in. I don't know why I said inflation as if it was expansionary. They're doing contractionary monetary policy where they're actually going to close that output gap a little bit. And that is going to basically bring that positive output gap down closer to something that is around zero, meaning that the flexible price output and the sticky price output are going to be equal to each other. When this output gap is negative, right, we're producing below the natural rate. Well, in that case, the central bank would have every incentive in the world 
to engage in expansionary monetary policy to try to close that output gap to get it closer to zero again. Because if they don't do that, well, we're at an inefficient equilibrium. So the closer we get to that flexible price output from the real business cycle model, the closer we are to an efficient equilibrium within the model. So if we think about it like this, okay, the new Keynesian Phillips curve is this blue curve that says SRAS, right? And this is the expected price level. Now in the real business cycle model, this was just the price level. Here it's the expected price level because firms are setting their prices based on the expectation of what they think things are going to be in the near future. So the expected price level always occurs when this red line, the long run aggregate supply curve or the aggregate supply curve that is predicted by the real business cycle model, thus the flexible price aggregate supply curve where everyone is hashtag woke, where that intersects with short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand, well, the intersection of these three guys leads to an expected price level. Now, should there be an aggregate demand shock where aggregate demand is like shifted out to here? Well, here, this isn't the expected price level. This will just be a price level. So that like E of PT zero, when these three guys intersect, if I've just got aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply intersecting, right, that would just be say P1. There would be no expectation there because the firms have not set all of their price levels yet. Some of the firms have, but not all of them. So there is no expected price level here. But as the short run aggregate supply curve shifts back in, right, where it is here and the aggregate demand curve crosses here, short run aggregate supply crosses here, then at the intersection point, that would be like the expectation of the price level, say PT2. And the output gap would be here if it's positive and it would be here if it's negative. So let's look at it this way, this YTF, Hashtag woke. This is the flexible price aggregate supply curve, right? It's flexible price because prices can move immediately, meaning it's not going to be upward sloping. <clears throat> this is sort of the long run aggregate supply curve. So when you think about the monetary neutrality stuff that we talked about with like the impulse responses, where there was an increase in the money supply, the price level jumped a little bit, output rose, wages rose, labor hours rose, we saw all of those real variables respond, but eventually they sort of went back down to where they were prior to the shock. Well, what that was telling me is that there was an aggregate demand shock. This upward sloping aggregate supply curve, right, allowed for prices to increase, but it also allowed for output to increase, which would mean that firms have to produce more, which means they need more labor. But that what monetary neutrality implies is that eventually this upward sloping aggregate supply curve shifts in as the price level goes up. As more firms can change their price, this curve shifts in and it intersects with the long run aggregate supply curve at a different point. Now the point for output will be the same, but it will be at a higher price level. So the price level will jump a little bit. Let's do it over here. So the price level's going nice and steady. It'll jump a little bit and sort of do this, and then it'll kind of keep increasing until all firms can change their prices, and then it will remain constant again. Meanwhile, output, if you're following the mouse, will increase and eventually go back down to where it was prior to the shock. That would be how monetary neutrality operates within the new Keynesian model. So there's short run monetary non-neutrality, but there is long run monetary neutrality. So that is what the neoclassical synthesis was talking about earlier. So policymakers at the central bank, who are now the third character in this movie, have an incentive to minimize this output gap as much as possible. So you'd think they'd always want it to be positive, but that's actually bad for a prolonged period of time. If the economy is constantly producing above its natural rate, it gets pushed beyond capacity for too long, Inflation increases, and that's bad. So what do I mean by it's getting pushed beyond capacity? Well, when it's pushed beyond its productive capacity, you're using up a lot of resources for production, and you're not, you don't have as many resources to save for investment. When you don't have that many resources for investment, 
well, you can't invest in your own company. You're basically just, you're running ragged all the time, right? It's, you've got a ton of work to do. You're drinking a lot of caffeine to try to keep doing your work, but you're not getting enough sleep, right? That's where you're being pushed beyond capacity. The firm is in the exact same situation, right? They don't have enough time for sleep. They don't have enough time to recharge. They don't have enough time to reinvest in their own capacity, so to speak. So they end up running at a loss, and that's not particularly good for them. So if you can use contractionary monetary policy to close the output gap from being positive closer to zero, it allows for some resources to get freed up, right? Capacity utilization falls, and when that happens, yes, you will see changes in inflation, um, but the trade-off would be uh, you'd have really, really high inflation otherwise. That's not a good thing. So, yeah, the new Keynesian-Phillips curve is actually the short-run aggregate supply curve in this ADAS framework. The slope of it is equal to omega, which is dependent on gamma. Now, let's talk about what this kappa tilde is. This kappa tilde is equal to this, 1 minus omega times 1 minus beta times omega over omega. All right, well, 1 minus omega is the share of firms that do get to change their prices every period. Omega is the share of firms that can't change their prices every period. But we multiply that by 1 minus beta times omega, and beta here is that discount factor. All right, so this kind of has to do with personal preferences on when to consume or save, right? Do they want to consume more now? Do they want to save more now? How patient are they, right? So we're factoring in households' patience when it comes to what this kappa tilde is equal to. So if I substitute the kappa tilde and theta hat into the new Keynesian Phillips curve, we get this stuff here. Okay, it looks like a lot of math. But it says that the relationship between output and inflation is equal to this, this gamma times 1 minus omega times 1 minus beta times omega divided by omega. If prices get stickier and omega goes up, then gamma goes down, meaning if gamma is small, the short-run aggregate supply curve is shallow, thus it's flatter, meaning output is more responsive than prices are. So we have to produce more because the price level can't go up as much. Now, in case you're wondering, like, oh, am I going to have to learn all this math of, like, deriving it from this and all that other stuff? No. No. I will show you what you need to know for this stuff. So don't worry about that. Now, the central bank can't control anything besides inflation. And the New Keynesian Phillips curve basically only constrains their monetary policy decisions, so it's not their objective function. Instead, their objective function is to choose a policy that minimizes inflation while closing the output gap, but they have to have a policy tool to do that. They have to have a now endogenous response function built within the model that wasn't previously there in the real business cycle model. Now, this policy function is called the Taylor Rule, named after John Taylor, who in 1993 uh, published a really cool paper talking about how the Federal Reserve sets their interest rates to manage real economic activity. And it looks something like this. So from this, what does this say? Well, this RT here is the Fed's policy rate. This is the federal funds rate, the overnight lending rate between banks. It is equal to the actual rate of inflation plus the targeted real rate of inflation plus this alpha pi times actual inflation minus the target rate of inflation. Right? So if you ever hear the Federal Reserve comes out and says, you know, we want to achieve a policy of 2% inflation per year, well, that 2% would be this pi t star. Now, recently, the Federal Reserve chairman came out, Jerome Powell, and he had said that basically what was going on now is he was planning on setting the target rate of inflation rather than just 2% per year he was planning on setting it to an average of 2% per year, which is a little different. But 
what this is telling me here is this out this pi t minus pi t star actual inflation minus the Fed's target rate of inflation are deviations, they're percentage point deviations between the actual rate of inflation and the target inflation rate or the inflation rate that the central bank wants to achieve. And this alpha pi here tells me how responsive the nominal interest rate is on money to changes or deviations in actual inflation from target inflation. But we're also adding this alpha y times the output gap. Right, so if the output gap is positive, then it's going to be increasing the nominal interest rate. If it's increasing the nominal interest rate here, right, because this output gap is positive, that means that the central bank is going to want to lower this nominal interest rate. Or sorry, they're going to want to increase the nominal interest rate. My bad, I don't know why I said lower. They're going to want to increase this nominal interest rate here in order to assist in trying to close this output gap. And then, of course, this alpha y explains how responsive this nominal interest rate is to deviations in actual output from the flexible price output, right? So the larger any change in the output gap is going to be reflecting to, or it's going to be mapping, I guess, to this nominal interest rate via this coefficient on that, this alpha sub y. So we have the nominal interest rate actually being set by the Fed, and it's equal to the current inflation rate, the target real interest rate, plus some other stuff, right? So if you were to drop all this other stuff, right, the nominal interest rate is equal to the inflation rate plus the real rate. So covering up all this other junk, and just looking at this term, the plus, and then this term. This is the Fisher rule. This is the Fisher equation. The Taylor rule assumes that the central bank is incorporating stuff from its dual mandate, namely stabilizing inflation and trying to minimize unemployment, or in this case, minimize the output gap. Right? The smaller that output gap is, ultimately the better off they are. So yes, this alpha pi times pi t minus pi t star is a percentage deviation of inflation from their target rate of inflation, which like I said, in the US, the Fed's target inflation rate is 2% per year. Then we also have the percentage deviation of the new Keynesian model's output and the flexible price output from the RBC model. And these alpha terms tell us really how much the Fed cares about inflation, alpha pi, and output, alpha y. So from this Taylor rule, what we're going to say is when we talked about inflation hawks and inflation doves, an inflation hawk is going to have this alpha pi be larger than alpha y. An inflation dove is going to have that flipped. Alpha y is larger than alpha pi. So an inflation hawk, basically what's going to be happening here is the inflation hawk is going to be assuming that this coefficient on the deviations of inflation from the target rate of inflation are going to really, 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 really matter when it comes to setting the nominal interest rate. However, an inflation dove, on the other hand, is going to be more concerned about deviations in output from its flexible price output level. And that's where you would have this alpha y coefficient and alpha. Now, these alpha terms also depend on the state of the economy, right? If we're in a recession and inflation is relatively low, the Fed's going to aim for dovish policies where this alpha y is larger than alpha pi, because at that point, we can deal with a bit more inflation to try to boost output. So they set a monetary aggregate to achieve a nominal interest rate, RT, consistent with the Taylor rule. So from this Taylor rule, all this stuff, right, alpha pi times pi t minus pi t star plus alpha y times y t minus y t f is equal to zero, then inflation is equal to the target, the output gap is zero, and the Taylor rule reduces to the Fisher equation. And in this case, there's no need for the central bank to use monetary policy in attempts to influence the business cycle, which would end up being the perfect scenario predicted by the real business cycle model, and we would have monetary neutrality. Before, right, in the real business cycle model, the central bank wasn't able to influence output with monetary policy, but now it can. So the question becomes, how can they do this? Well, it's because that 
they have sticky prices. And yes, the sticky prices are the reason they can do this, but it's not known as the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Recall the transmission mechanism of monetary policy, I've talked about it once or twice throughout the course, is really how monetary policy, how monetary policy shocks, we'll say, can transmit these nominal shocks, monetary policy shocks, to real shocks, right? How they can, how nominal monetary policy shocks can ultimately influence real variables, right? And this transmission mechanism is really the variable through which monetary policy shocks actually transmit to real economic activity. Now, here the Taylor rule is what actually identifies the transmission mechanism. And the transmission mechanism in the New Keynesian model, it's considered to be the real interest rate. If we looked at that ISLM graph in the New Keynesian model, right, it's the same as the real business cycle model, but it has an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve, so aggregate demand shocks have real effects. The variable it transmits through is the real interest rate, which was the vertical axis and that ISLM graph that we looked at that sat directly above the aggregate demand, aggregate supply framework, which again works off of the Fisher equation. So if prices are slow to adjust and inflation doesn't pick up the slack, the real interest rate responds, transmitting to output via the real interest rate. But the only policy tool isn't just what the central bank uses. The fiscal authority also plays a role, right? The fiscal authority here is going to be the fourth character. So let's sort of recap our characters. The first character was the household. The second character was the firm. Third character was the central bank or the monetary authority or the Federal Reserve in the United States. The fourth character is the fiscal authority or the treasury in the United States. They also play a role. They can either tax or they can borrow by selling bonds today at a price Q and an interest rate RT subscript B for bond. The idea for how the government operates is based on some theories by this incredible economist named John Maynard Keynes. Who's that guy? Well, he's this guy. He's considered to be the father of modern macroeconomics. His ideas were put to work during the Great Depression, and they've really dominated countercyclical fiscal policy ever since. The idea was relatively simple, although it wasn't 100% correct. There were some problems with it. But the idea was to have high taxes and low spending during an economic boom to develop a budget surplus. You know, wouldn't that be nice if that actually happened now? And therefore, if we enter a recession, they can dump that surplus and maybe also engage in some deficit spending if the surplus wasn't enough into the economy to try to boost GDP. He argued that recessions were caused by slack aggregate demand, and thus the government could stimulate demand by boosting government spending in the equation for real GDP to offset the reductions in both consumption and investment. And it was pretty revolutionary stuff. I mean, he is the guy this model's named after. He's also the guy that we can thank for the $787 billion stimulus bill in 2008, 2009, and the $2.2 trillion stimulus bill from, it says this month, I actually made this slideshow in uh, April or May of earlier this year, but the $2.2 trillion um, stimulus plan to keep the U.S. economy from outbreak. So all that, everybody gets their $1,200 check, well, that's, they get that $1,200 $1,200 check, thanks to the work of John Maynard Keynes from the like 1930s and 1940s. So there is, in fact, a role for government spending here. And this government spending shock is going to shift aggregate demand. But there are short-run effects where you can increase output rather than not, not at all in the real business cycle model. But the New Keynesian model tends to favor monetary policy over fiscal policy for a few reasons. One, fiscal policy is pretty slow to get passed. I mean, if you think about how incredibly stupid people are in Congress and how they always have to, you know, argue and, you know, nitpick over minutia and, of course, you know, try to get do some pork barreling to bring home the bacon for their own constituents, this stuff goes really, really, really slow and it takes a long time to get implemented into the economy. Monetary policy, on the other hand, has far faster effects. 
Federal Open Market Committee members can vote very quickly to intervene, and thus it's much more effective. They can respond in a matter of hours, whereas Congress can respond in a matter of months, as we saw at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak. The monetary authority response at the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak was very, very, very fast. The fiscal response was pretty slow, right? The shutdowns really started in early March, and it was somewhere around mid to late April that the insultingly low $1,200 stimulus paycheck went out to everybody. And it's like, okay, great. That's how, how's that going to help me? Like at the time, my rent was like 700 bucks a month. So it covered one month of rent. Thanks. Really appreciate that. Very kind of you. But ultimately, the government is still kind of treated like the kid eating glue in the corner. So this is our government. This is also our government. This is a member of our government, and uh, yeah, the way he's holding that gun, just, ooh, his shoulder is going to be sore tomorrow. Someone does not know how to fire a weapon. So, moving forward, it's time to talk about how the economy responds to shocks, and this requires a little bit more hands-on approach to the teaching. So I'm going to switch over to showing you in person, well, I guess in video, because, you know, thanks, COVID to how the model responds to shocks. There are a few more moving parts than what we saw in the real business cycle model because there's a short run adjustment process to the long run equilibrium that we see in the RBC model. So you'll know that in the long run, everything will look just like the real business cycle model, but the new Keynesian model has some intermediate steps that are required to get there. This adjustment phase is what makes it such a useful model for policymakers because the whole point of it is to stabilize the business cycle, basically making the highs less high and the lows less low without inhibiting long-run economic growth. So this is our aggregate demand, aggregate supply equilibrium framework. And when I make a couple of in-person videos, right, where I'm just standing in front of the dry erase board rambling away, this is what we're going to be going off of. There's also just going to be a graph above the aggregate demand, aggregate supply stuff. But I suppress that just so you can sort of see what's going on within these four graphs because that's ultimately the most expensive or the most important stuff so um yeah at one hour and two minutes i will go ahead and wrap up this video uh be on the lookout because i'll talk about certain types of shocks in the new keynesian model in the next video where i'm just standing in front of a dry erase board looking like an idiot drawing pictures so uh until then uh enjoy yourselves and we will reconvene when the next video gets posted. Thanks for watching.